I thank you for Jesus this morning. I thank you because he, his ear is not to his ear is not deaf, his arm is not weak, his eye is not blind. He sees everything that goes on in every one of our lives. His arm is so powerful that all he has to do is reach out and touch and make us whole. His ear can still hear the prayers and the cries of people who pray in faith. And your word, Father, says if we agree together that whatever we say to the mountain that stands in our path will be removed. And if we won't doubt in our hearts, but we believe that what we say comes to pass, we can have whatever we say. <clears throat> this morning, Holy Spirit, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will show up and show out in behalf of these needs today. I pray that you'll heal these that are sick, these names that are written on this sheet. We pray for them every week, but I still believe you're hearing and answering prayer. You're still doing miracles that we may not know of. And today, in Jesus' name, all across this room and across the internet, of those watching this morning and those upon this prayer sheet, Holy Spirit, rise with healing in your wings and bring deliverance today for the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ. I thank you for hearing. I appreciate your prayers, Holy Spirit. I appreciate you spreading out your wings to heal. And I believe that you're ministering now to those with heart diseases, to those with liver conditions, to those with sinus conditions, to those that are battling allergies today. Would you minister healing power and healing touch to them right now for the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ. I'll give you praise and I'll give you thanks. Because I believe you've heard us as we've prayed. And miracles will occur for the glory of God. For it's in Jesus' name I ask it. And Father, we close our time of prayer by praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. It's on the screen. And would you pray with me out loud and loudly, please, and say it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Remain standing with me, would you please? We're going to speak the word of the Lord over our lives this morning. In a moment, I'm going to introduce our speaker, but I want you to sit, hold your Bibles up in whatever form you may have it in today. Whether you have an iPhone or you have the Bible in your hand, would you declare with me out loud, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. The day I will be taught the Word of God, I boldly confess my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I will never be the same. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord bless you. I must say that I am so proud of Megan and Adam Atterbury. I appreciate these kids tremendously. They're kids to me. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but they are. But they have the spirit of the Lord upon their lives, and I'm so grateful for them. Next Sunday morning, I'll begin a new series entitled Mastermind, when the Holy Spirit will be talking about how to control. I can't get away from the subject I, I've been dealing with for the last four weeks, but next Sunday morning we're going to start a new series along a different line, but almost some things that need to be said to all of us. So taking a break in the midst of ending one series and starting another, I asked Pastor Adam, I said, I want you to speak on this first Sunday. In a moment, in a few moments, when he's finished, we're going to head to the table of the Lord. And I appreciate their servant heart I appreciate the work they do around Anchor of Life Church so very, very much. Would you make the youth pastor, the children's pastor, our friend, Adam Atterbury, to this point. This I'll get you out of here by kickoff, okay? 
started reading the Bible, you know, you're supposed to. <laughs> and I came across some stories in the Bible, and the stories kind of went something like this. It was Bob and Jim had a friend, and they brought that friend, Tom, to Jesus. <laughs> See, the New Testament is just full of stories of people bringing their friends to Jesus. So they want this person to meet and interact with Jesus. I want to look at some implications and some applications of those interactions. Maybe you've been invited to a formal event, uh, let's say a party or something like that. You get an invitation and it's dressed, addressed to you something like, it says, Mr. Lord's Adam had a very plus one. You're invited to whatever, whatever. So first of all, if it's addressed to me as Lord's Adam Atterbury, means one of two things. Either this person doesn't know me very well, or I'm in trouble with my mom. <laughs> but what does this plus one mean? What can I do with that? I can bring somebody, right? If I'm smart, I'll bring my wife. But I can bring somebody. I can bring anybody I want. I can invite someone to come with me. I've given the freedom and the privilege to invite someone. Now, Easter is right around the corner, and we celebrate the fact that Jesus stepped into creation, that God put on flesh, and he lived a life that we couldn't live, but we were meant to. He lived a life without sin. He went to a cross to die a death that was meant for us, to make a payment we couldn't pay, to offer us salvation that we so desperately needed. So what does that mean? It means that Jesus went to the cross to make us his plus one in heaven. See, he's the only one who rightly has a place in heaven. He's the guest of honor. He's the one that rightly has a place, but he's given us an invitation to return to the life meant for us. He's offered us to be his plus one. So I ask you, who is your plus one? That means that this week you need to get into your neighborhood your workplace or your community and give someone who doesn't know Jesus. You need to get out and find a plus one for the next service. But for sure by Easter service. Alright, so I want to get started by, by looking at Luke chapter 5. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. If you don't have a Bible, look on, on the pew in front of you. There's probably one there. And if that still doesn't work for you, Claudia is going to project one up on the screen. There's words up here on the screen, so we don't have any excuses. <laughs> Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 17, we find a story that's a pretty well-known story. It's a story of four guys with a friend or a relative. We, we don't really know the relationship. But they have someone they care for who is physically paralyzed, and these guys want to get their friend to Jesus. And so Jesus is teaching in a house where there are some onlookers and some religious leaders. We're going to look at the story and see what does it mean in regards to you and your heart when we invite a friend or family member to church. But we're not, we're not here today just to talk about what's going to happen in a few weeks. What does this mean today? I believe that God has a word for us. If our hearts and our ears and our minds are open today, He, is, he has a word for us today, something for us to take fresh today to know more about him and his plan for our lives. So we're going to jump into the story, Luke chapter 5, verse 17. Let's see what the treasure for us today is. One day Jesus was teaching and the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village in Galilee and from Judah and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him to the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went on a roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, 
or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home, praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Let's pray. Father, this morning we gather, and I pray that our hearts would be ready to hear from you. I pray the truth of the narrative of the text today would penetrate our hearts. I pray for those needing encouragement, that they would find it. I pray for those needing a physical touch, that they would receive it. I pray for those who came here, or Father, for those who are watching somewhere and need salvation, that they will hear the call of your voice and that they would respond today in obedience. Father, may much be made of your name, the name of Jesus. Let our church be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, normally when Pastor Gary speaks after, after reading the scripture, he usually gives you certain points that he wants you to take home. It's usually three to five points. And, and I'm not going to do that today. <laughs> what I'm going to do today, I just want to move through the narrative and, and look at the perspective of all the players involved in the story. So we have, we have these friends that we just read about. We have the Pharisees. We have the paralytic guy. And we have Jesus. And we also have all the onlookers. So I want to move through the story and, and just ask you at the end, where do you find yourself? Who do you relate to at the end of the story? And what do you do based on that relationship? So there may be times throughout this, this message that I'm going to ask you to write this down because it might be beneficial for later, but there's no bullet point to take home with you today. So let's just move through the story. Before I jump into the character analysis, I want to point out something in verse 17 that I believe is really the foundation of the whole story. Verse 17 starts like this. One day Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were standing there. See, they come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. So let me paint this picture in your mind. Jesus is gathered in a home. He's in someone's living room, and he's teaching. People have heard of him, and they want to see him, and the text tells us the house was packed. Pharisees, or church leaders of the day, gathered from all the surrounding villages and towns to see Jesus. But let me tell you, they're not there to see this miraculous dude. They're there for one purpose, and that's to entrap Jesus. They want to catch Jesus saying something wrong. They want to be able to say, this young rabbi is a hoax. He's a fake. He's a phony. This dude is crazy. You just need to listen to us. We know what we're talking about. See, the Pharisees, they would actually follow Jesus around the village, listen to him teach, trying to, to catch him and trap him. So there's these Pharisees, this group of Pharisees. We don't know how many there are. Two, twenty, I don't know. Whatever. I don't know how many are. I don't know. And then you have a group of onlookers filling the place. There would have been a tension in this room because you have Pharisees there to trap Jesus, and you have onlookers there curious to see who Jesus is. Now these Pharisees have taken what's called the seats of honor. They could have gotten their leg, and the crowd would have parted so that the Pharisees would make their way to the front of the room. They would have been wearing their fancy robes and their fancy hats, and they would have walked right through the crowd with a sense of entitlement. An attitude that they belong in the front and you guys are scum in the back. The first couple of rows would have been this, the religious leaders and behind them would have been everybody else. What the text goes on to tell us in verse 17 is what's really the foundation of the story. It says, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. So have you guys ever been to a public arena? Or maybe a political debate, or a sporting event, or a concert. Have you ever been somewhere where you could say at this place, the atmosphere in this room is electric? Or the atmosphere is charged? <coughs> so if you guys know me, you know I'm an avid sports fan, especially when it comes to OU. OU football is like, wow. And I've had an opportunity to, to, to go to a couple of games. And I'm going to tell you guys, these people 
putting on these games, they know what they're doing. Because the game is great. It's a great game, and I love to watch it. But they also have this great entertainment value. You know why? The people there understand the fact that not everybody at the game is there because they're fans. Some are there because they got drunk there. Their kids had to go because the parents wanted to. Or some friends who just, whatever, I got a free ticket, I'm going to go. There'll be spouses who don't care about football. So they try to create an entertainment value. As much as I love the game, I have to admit, the pre-game was phenomenal. Before the game, there's like 100,000 people trying to find their seats. Owen Field only holds 85,000, but don't tell anybody that. They say 100,000 every time. But there's loud music playing. And I'm there with my friends. We're trying to find our seat, and, and this, this excitement starts to build in the atmosphere. And right before the game starts, the big screen comes on, and you see some of the legends of OU football. It starts off with pictures and stats and Heisman Trophy winners. And some of the more recent legends, they start talking, and they're doing this pregame, and they're yelling, and they're screaming, and spits flying everywhere. And you can just feel the excitement building and building and building. And then all of a sudden, the roughnecks shoot their guns. And Boomer and Sooner, they run out on the field with the Sooner Sooner behind them, and the football players come in, the whole place just erupts. Fans, non-fans, the excitement just erupts into this loud roar. The players come on, and the excitement is just everywhere. So this, this term, a charged atmosphere, though, well, I'm going to get a little nerdy on you guys. I'm a, I'm a physics chemist guy. Like so it's a real scientific phenomenon. It's called St. Elmo's Fire. It most commonly is referred to, it happens when ships are out at sea because of the, the salt in the air and, and the electrons and all that nerdy stuff. But I read a story recently about a hiker. They're trying to summit some crazy tall mountain. I don't think this is a good idea, but they didn't ask me. And as they climb to higher and higher altitudes, the air gets really thin. The thinner the air, the harder it is to breathe. So as they're climbing the altitude, altitude, the writer of the story, he starts to notice that the atmosphere is being electrically charged. So these guys are climbing, they're somewhere at 10,000 plus feet in the air, and the guy who's writing the story says he starts to feel the hairs on his arms standing up. Have you ever had that before? You know, the static electricity around you, and then you gotta go find somebody to touch them. That's when you get a little bit scared to touch the doorknob because you know you're going to get shot. So this is like that, but times 100. The electricity is building so much that the hiker in front of the guy telling the story could see the hair under his toboggan start to stand up. And that's when you notice something that, that this is the, the heart of what St. Elmo's fire is. See, the, the hikers are all carrying their hiking packs. And their packs are supported by these metal braces. So this guy is riding as the hair on his arms are standing up and the, his friend in front of him, hair standing up on the back of his head, that he noticed something and this when he knew something was seriously wrong. See, the metal on his friend's backpack started to glow blue. This is actually St. Elmo's fire. When the atmosphere is so electrically charged, that metal starts to conduct electricity. So thank God he noticed it, and he yelled to his friends, and they threw their backpacks one way, and they dove the other way, and within seconds of hitting the ground, lightning struck their backpacks. Wow. See, the premise of St. Elmo's fire is that the atmosphere becomes so charged that lightning strike is imminent. I say all this because this is what this room was like. There was tension between the onlookers curious as to know who Jesus is, and the Pharisees trying to prove him wrong and catch him in a trap. Jesus is teaching the truth. The tension is getting built up, and the display of supernatural power of Jesus is imminent. And we know this because my Bible and your Bible tells us that the power to heal was with him. So as the text goes on, we get introduced to these four guys bringing their friends to, to be relieved. They want him to be relieved to Jesus. They come to the door, and the text tells us that when they get there, they can't get through. There's too much in the crowd. 
Maybe they try and they're like, excuse me, excuse me. Now, if it's just one of us getting through a crowd, probably really not that big of a deal. But there's four of us, and we got a friend on a mat, and we're not going to get through a big crowd. People aren't going to move out of our way. So the, for the four guys at the end of the stretcher and a paralyzed man lying on it, you can't just make your way through the crowd. So they have to back up. You know, they're like, beep, beep, beep. The text tells us that they can't get up, and they didn't go. They didn't give up. They didn't just go hey, Let's go to Pastor Jim's house next door. Maybe he can help us. They didn't tell the guy on the map, dude. Maybe next time. They back up, and the story tells us what they do. They climb a roof, and they throw their paralyzed friend up there. Now. Let, let me give you a little, a little vision of, of what the city would have looked like, right? So it would have been common for the houses to have a staircase that led up to the roof. So this staircase was just in case the roof got damaged and they needed to make repairs to the roof. It's kind of like a built-in lab. Now let's talk about the roof. The roof would have consisted of large beams running parallel to each other, and they go in perpendicular to those, there would have been uh, twigs and, and brush and stuff called the thatch. There would have been a covering on the rafters, and going across it were long, thinner pieces of branches and twigs. So this was the foundation of the roof. Now, if it would have been left like that on a rainy day, it would have got wet. So to make sure the roof was sealed, they took mud. They would take earth and they would get up there and they would cover all the roof with mud. In fact, scholars even say that in the springtime, you could walk through the villages and grass would be growing on the roofs of these houses. This is why I say all that. When we read the text, the text says they removed the tile. And it's natural to think of a ceiling tile like what we have here. Because that's what we know. But these guys had to... These guys... We got to, they got to Jesus, so they climbed the stairs with the stretcher, and they get there, and they have to dig through the roof. So they dig through the mud, and they get to a layer of thatch, and they pull the thatch away, and then they lower their friend down in between the timbers. It's not like they just simply climbed up on a roof and removed the tire. There was some painstaking work that had to be done. They went through great effort to get their friend there. I kind of love this. This is just something I thought about during the week. When they first get on the roof, and Jesus is teaching to the crowd, they're up on the roof. They can't hear the commotion going on inside. The roof is probably two feet thick of mud. So as they started digging, there probably would have been some debris that started to fall down. And so, so I, I, I just vision, okay, Jesus is up in front of the crowd. The Pharisees are in front of him and the onlookers. Now, these guys aren't stupid. They know where to dig. they got to get up out by Jesus. They're not going to dig in the back. So as they're digging, the debris starts to fall down, and the irony kind of happens. The people who came to throw mud get mud. I think that's kind of awesome. So these guys, they pull the roof, and picture this. A mat starts to be lowered down. You hear voices saying, You've got to attend to our friend. He needs you. You're the only one. The man gets lowered down, and then we see the exchange that takes place. For just a moment, let's walk through what's happening with each group of people. I want to start with the friends and the paralytic. These four guys and their paralyzed friend, when I look at the action that took place, and what length these guys went to to get their friend to Jesus, what I see is great love. You can write that down. Between the friends and the paralytic, the characteristic that was present was love. <laughs> These guys either, it's their friend or a relative, but they had great affection for this guy. Love was the initiator of their action. At minimum, they take their friend, they carry him to the house, and as we, as we read, they get there to the house and they can't get in. And so they back up, and they don't say, sorry, bud, we can't get to Jesus. 
They didn't get to the door and say, see me next time. They get to the door and they back up and then they come up with a plan. They did not plan on going to the roof. When they got there, that was not the original plan. They just planned on going through the front door. But what they, they did, they did not give up. They developed a plan. One of these guys probably thought a little bit like me, was like, dude, get me up on the roof and lower me down. We got some pools, we got some ropes, we can figure it out. But one of the guys develops a, a plan to drag the stretcher up on the roof, dig a hole and lower their friend. Why? Because they were driven by love. Do you see how we can parallel this with God's love for us? In John chapter 3, verse 16, we all know what it says. It tells us that God so loved the world that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. So when you take that narrative and you lay it on top of this story, you could read it this way. For God so loved the world, he tore a hole in a roof. For God so loved the world, he dug through the mud and the muck, the brokenness of our sins, and tore a hole in the roof so he could lower his son down to us. He so loved the world, he tore a hole in the roof and lowered his son so his son could go to the cross and take our place to give us eternal life. Now here's the truth, though. Our love can't save you. My love and your love can't save anyone. We must individually, willfully decide to respond to the call of Jesus Christ. If only we could love people enough that they would just have to get saved. And let me admit something to you. As a preacher, my mind doesn't get to this sometimes. Maybe yours does, but mine doesn't grasp this one. See, I believe... In a hundred percent is the sovereignty of God. Now, sovereignty is a five-dollar word that means God is in control of everything. I believe God is over every single detail of salvation. I believe He orchestrates and plans salvation. But in this great tension of believing in complete sovereignty of God, I understand that He drew me to Himself. And I had to respond to Him. I had to acknowledge my sinful state and respond in faith. So maybe God's plan is that way. So it would be a motivator for us to share the good news of Jesus. I believe with all of my heart that my love can't save anyone. But I also believe that sometimes if I'm not willing to love people with a love that rips holes in roofs, they may never hear, hear the healing power of Jesus. If I'm not willing to love people to the extent that I would rip a hole in the roof so they could get to Jesus, then maybe, maybe they will never hear of the healing power of Jesus. So if you call yourself a Christ follower, and you believe the Bible to be true, and believe it or not, there are some people who claim they're Christ followers, but they don't believe in the Bible. I don't know how that works, but... But if you call yourself a Christ follower, you know the answer to the problem of pain and suffering. I'm not saying you understand it. There's a difference between knowing the answer and understanding it. If you don't believe me, step into my physics class. I'd give my students the answers, and their job was to figure out the solution. How did you get there? They didn't like that very much. I mean, imaginary numbers. What the heck is that even mean? See, I don't understand why there's pain and suffering, but I know the answer to it. I pledge my life to Jesus Christ, and I surrender to his authority in my life. I will go through difficult days. I'll have struggles. I'll have struggles with health. I'll have financial struggles. But at the end, what I know to be true is all of these realities, they have an expiration date. I will leave this life and I will go to my real life and be free of all those things. If I believe that to be true, and if I believe that Jesus is who he says he is, if I believe he is the truth and the light and the way, again, some Christians don't believe that. Let me just say this. 
You can't be a Christian and believe that there's another way besides Jesus. If you believe he's the way, the truth, and the life, the only answer to the problems is him. If I believe what the Bible says, that to not ex accept Jesus but to reject him means an eternity apart from him, if I believe those things, yet tell no one about it, I can't cl claim to love anyone. If my friend is dying of starvation and I know where to find food, but I tell my friend, sorry man, your situation sucks, but I don't ever tell him where the food is, I can say a lot of things, but I can't say I love him. Honestly, that's a simple man's version of the gospel. One beggar telling another beggar where he can find food. So this is why I'm preaching plus one today. The reality is if your love, if you love Jesus, then you have to love other people. If you can't go to your co-workers, your family members, your neighbors, and your friends and just invite them to church, not just invite them to church, but actually tell them about the gospel of Jesus, you may need to reevaluate how much you say you love others in Jesus. See, these guys, they were motivated. <laughs> They didn't get to the door and say, sorry, maybe next time. They climbed a roof. They dug a hole. They were motivated by love. They were also driven by hope. A hope fueled by a conviction that Jesus was the only one who could help. See, I believe that the paralytic was the one that was coaching them on. We can do this. Saying some, get me on the roof. I can't leave here without... Seeing Jesus. The others were probably like, I don't know, man. This guy's lost it. <laughs> I can't believe what this dude get him on the roof. But they, they had hope. They had a hope fueled by conviction that Jesus was the only one. See, Peter shares this in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. I'm going to paraphrase this, but it says something like, There is no other way, no other name but Jesus by which men get saved. Salvation is not through your good works. And thank God it's not through your good looks, John Cody. <laughs> it's, not, it's not by your church name. It's not by how much faith your family has. But only by the name of Jesus. See, they had a love that affected their hope. They had a, a hope that drove their faith. See, faith is the active counterpart to hope. Hope without faith is just a wish. What do I mean? It's not that these guys loved this guy enough to get him up there. It's not that the five of them collectively had enough hope that Jesus was the only one who could do something. They had a faith and a belief, not just that Jesus could, but that he would do something. Some of us right now, what we need to hear today is not about who we're inviting on Easter, but that we got problems in our lives. And you need Jesus to save you. It may be something in a relationship, something to do with your work. Maybe it's the lack of work. Maybe it's your money. Maybe it's your lack of money. The truth is, you've been around the church to know that Jesus can do something. But you keep trying to fix it yourself because you're not convinced that. Jesus doesn't hold out on his children. These guys have a love and a hope. They had a faith, an assurance, not just that Jesus could do something, but that he would do something. All five men had faith because of what verse 20 tells us. Look at verse 20 for just a minute. It says, when Jesus saw your faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, I just said earlier that my love can't save you. Neither can my faith. You can grow up in a deeply religious family who loves you and prays for you, but there comes a time when you have to open your heart to Jesus. Jesus did not heal the paralytic because of the faith of his friends. He looked at all five men and saw their faith, and he said, your sins are forgiven. I'm telling you, no one else's faith can save you. I promise you, Jesus didn't look at the five, the four guys and say, your faith is so amazing, 
I'm going to kill this guy over here. In the commentary in my head, I see the paralyzed man on the mat encouraging his friends on. I see him telling them, you can't give up. I have to see Jesus. He's the only one who can help me. And through the encouragement and faith, the others push on in love. Let me say this. If you want to see the Rio Grande Valley transformed, it's going to take that kind of faith. God's up to something in our community that he's not doing in other communities. I believe he's up to something in our church that he's not doing in other churches. But if you want to see all of these things come to fruition, if you want to experience the power of revival, if we want to see one or ten, a hundred or a thousand people come to know Jesus, even if one person comes to know him, it's worth it. And you better believe that if it's possible for one, it's possible for 10,000 people to, do, to come to know Jesus. You need that faith and assurance that Jesus is who he says he is. So when I look at these guys, I notice their faith was persistent. Again, I'm really driving this point home. They didn't leave when the house was full. They climbed the roof, they dug a hole, and they lowered their friend down. They didn't worry about what it looked like. They didn't worry if it was culturally acceptable. They didn't care if they looked like fools. I fear sometimes that in our culture, we as Christians have become so politically correct. Now let me tell you this. It's not always a bad thing to be politically correct. But in the fear of, of being politically correct, we've become so fearful of offending people that we lost our persistent faith. If we're going to go tell someone about Jesus, what he's done in our life, guess what? Some people aren't going to want to hear you. They don't want to hear what you have to say. But be persistent in love. When I was a kid, I was around Christians pretty much my whole life. But it took many years for it to sink down into my heart. But I'm real thankful that nobody gave up on me. We need to have that kind of faith that says, you know what? If I can't get to the door, I'll find a roof. If there's not a hole in the roof, I'll make a hole in the roof. They had a persistent faith. Honestly, they had a creative faith also. Guys, yeah, they made a hole in the roof. This isn't sacrificial faith at all. It took some energy. It took some effort. If you want to see God-like things happen in the Rio Grande Valley, we got to have God-like faith. Now, I want to take a look at the Pharisees. Because the truth of the matter is the man on the mat, he may have been physically paralyzed, but the Pharisees were spiritually paralyzed. Where there was an unyielding crowd to let the man through, these guys had an unyielding hearts to allow Jesus in. Whereas these four guys had great love for their paralyzed friend, the Pharisees were filled with indifference. Jesus pronounced that the man's sins had been forgiven, and they couldn't help themselves. They started to complain. Whereas these guys were filled with hope that Jesus was the only way, the Pharisees had hope in themselves. They were people of the law, the rules and regulations. Let me just say, if you're here today and you're listening online and you're hoping that your attendance, your church attendance, your family's faith and your good works and your baptism and your giving record, if you hope all these things will tilt the balance in your favor, you're hoping in yourself. To hope in the law, to hope in good works, to hope in yourself, the whole purpose of the law wasn't so we could have a standard of keep. The law was given to show us we couldn't keep the standard. The law was not given to provide salvation, but point to the Savior. So these guys had great, had hearts full of indifference, and as the friends had faith. All the Pharisees seemed to have a criticism. Verse 20 again tells us that Jesus, moved by their faith, tells the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. Now if you think about it, this guy, this paralyzed guy, he didn't come to the church to be forgiven of his sins. In fact, it might even sound kind of cruel. 
He came to the church. We can leave. He can walk away from the church. And Jesus doesn't heal him immediately. Jesus forgives him of his sins. And when Jesus says you're forgiven of your sins, the Pharisees lose it. See, this is what's amazing. Jesus knows these guys are here all along the traffic. Jesus knows what they're up to. And he's going to let them do it anyway. He makes a statement that your sins are forgiven. You know what's interesting in the story is what the Pharisees struggle with is what a lot of us struggle with. Submission and authority. The reality is we can't receive the forgiveness and healing so desperately needed if we're not willing to submit to the authority of Jesus in our lives. So here are the Pharisees. Unwilling to recognize Jesus' authority. And guess what? They're about to get a taste. Because Jesus says, Your sins are forgiven, and the text says, They begin to mummer, and they begin to think in their hearts. You got Tom the Pharisee saying, Who does this guy think he is? Pronouncing forgiveness of sins. And Jesus turns around. He's like, Tom, I hear what you're thinking. He says, I perceived your thoughts. And he says, why do you question not in your mouth, but in your hearts? And Jesus gave them what they came for. Because Jesus says, do you think it's easier to say your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise and walk? And without giving them a chance to answer, Jesus goes on. But if I had, but if he had given them a chance to answer, I believe the Pharisees would have said it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. Why? Can't verify. I can look at someone and say, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. But there's no way to verify that what I said had any weight to it. See, Jesus, he wasn't being cruel to the, to the man on the mat. Where you're, when he said your sins are forgiven, because Jesus dealt with the greatest need. It would have been better for the guy to leave paralyzed on the mat with salvation than to walk out without knowing Jesus. Jesus tended to first what was needed. We could believe in the supernatural power of Jesus. We should pray for miracles and healings because the same power that did it then can do it now. The Bible tells us that non-believers, demons, and the power of Satan and evil forces have the ability to do supernatural works. But only Jesus has the power to ransom men's heart. I believe with all my heart when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. I don't believe the paralyzed man was disappointed. I believe that when Jesus said that the man got relieved of something that he didn't even know he needed relieved of. See, Jesus asked the Pharisees which one is easier and then he told the man, rise and walk. Because that's the type of God we serve. One who gives abundantly. If you're willing to have extraordinary faith in an extraordinary God, we will see extraordinary things. So here's the question I have for you. Who are you in the story? Are you the four guys? Let me clarify something. You can't say you're one of the four guys there's no one on your mat. These guys didn't climb the roof and tear a hole to lower an empty mat to Jesus. You can't claim to be one of the four guys full of faith and hope and love if you're not actually bringing people to Jesus. The priority is not bringing people to this building, but telling people about the gospel of Jesus. Maybe you're on the mat. Are you waiting for someone to invite you and share the love of Jesus Christ? We talk about this every week, and I know some people may be struggling with your hearts. Or are you the paralytic, going through struggles of life, needing help with your finances, your marriage, your job? You need Jesus to touch you. Jesus to touch that job situation, that financial situation, that health situation. Or maybe you have the hope that he is the only one. And maybe you're lying on the mat to save life. If you know he's the only one who can do something, 
but you're just unsure if you will. When we, when we do the altar call, I encourage you to bring that doubt forward. We're going to have our prayer warriors come up here. We're going to have the band go ahead and come up and start playing some music. If you're in need of prayer, grab one of these prayer warriors. You're on the way up here. And grab them by the hand. And tell them, I just need to be reminded who Jesus is in my life. Even if you don't see the vision of fulfillment, you trust the process. Maybe some of you are on the map, and here's the bottom line. You need Jesus. Your browse isn't physical or financial or relational outside of Jesus. Come forward off the map and just say, I need Jesus today. I need him to come into my life. I need forgiveness of my sins. My good work will never do it. Maybe you're the onlooker. You're here to see if Jesus really is who he says he is. I assure you, he is, and so much more. Get off the fence and willfully make a decision to surrender and follow him. Maybe you're a Pharisee. You're here today, but your heart's full of doubt. Guess what? Jesus is big enough to take those doubts away. I'm going to ask you to move now. As the Hilltop Band starts to play, if, you were, if somebody's name came to your mind that you need, that you know needs to be your plus one, write that name down. And as our prayer warriors are up here, bring that name and let's pray over it. And pray that their heart softens to the, to the word of God. If you're struggling with your finances and you just need God's touch, come forward. Our prayer warriors are awesome. They will help you with that. And help find God in your life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you do in our lives, Father. I pray that, that we just abundantly accept your love, God, God, and we just take that love and we turn around and put it into the world. Just let us have the love for others that we're just willing to rip a hole in the roof, dig through mud, and just bring people to you, God. God, your love is greater than we ever deserve. You showed us the way, God, and I just pray that we just fall into that. We pray this all in pray.
stand with me all over the room, please? These are stationary. And I'm going to ask you while the band plays to come down the center aisle, take of these cups or of the chalice and bread, go back to your seat after you worship the Lord. All right. Come now, Jesus. Mm -hmm.
grace that you extended to planet Earth. John Newton had an insight when he wrote the power of the words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was that one on the map, but somebody brought me to Jesus. Thank you for grace, Holy Spirit. Thank you for grace. I appreciate it. And I thank you, Father, for Jesus this morning. For his broken body and his precious shed blood that would redeem 